So for you level four folks, you already know that we've sort of identified private eye as a sort of example of the modern day radical press, haven't we? And uh, lots of kind of subversive stuff going on in private eye. So James has got some interesting things to tell you about his life as a cartoonist. Um, so I'll hand over to James. Thank Thanks you. very much. Thank you. Hello everyone. Um, so, I'm a cartoonist. Uh, I work for um, the Sheffield Star, which is a daily newspaper, um, six days a week, um, and the Sheffield Telegraph, which is a weekly, plus lots of uh, magazines such as uh, Private Eye, uh, The Spectator, The Oldie, um, and, and, and lots more. So what I want to do today uh, is, is two things. Um, first of all, I just wanted to take you through a, a quick potted history of the newspaper and magazine cartoon in this country um, to put in context the things you see in the newspapers today. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about um, me. Um, I'm going to talk about what it's like to be a newspaper cartoonist uh, working on newspapers, um, the kind of things that we're faced with, how we tackle certain types of news stories, um, and then just show you a few examples of what I do. So first of all, um, I just want to start off with a very short story. Mel Kalman, who was the Times front page news cartoonist in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, was at a party. And um, he's standing at the party with his drink, and somebody comes up to him and says, so uh, what do you do? So uh, Mel Kalman says, oh, I'm a, I'm a cartoonist. So the person, uh, the girl who asked, thought about it, said, oh, that's very nice. Thought about it some more and said, so what else do you do? So that's what I'm going to talk about. What does a cartoonist do? So I'm going to start off with this. Now, this in, a, in a nice sort of way, isn't a cartoon, and it's not from a newspaper. But what it is, is this is a Hogarth print. Um, this is from the 1740s, long time ago. Now, Hog Hogarth was an artist, a proper artist. Um, but he was a bit... It was a bit skint, and he needed some money. So he decided what, he, what he'd do is he'd have a go at visual satire. So this is called Gin Lane. Uh, and this is set on a, a, a suburb of London, which no longer exists. It's a slum suburb, pretty much where the British Library is now. Um, and what it is is social satire on news of the day. What had happened around this time was gin was an incredibly popular drink. Um, and because it was so popular, the government thought, you know, we, we want a bit of the action. So they levied a huge tax on gin. So what that meant was people could no longer afford it. So we went underground. There was illicit gin parlors. 25% um, of all residences made and sold gin in this part of London. But it was bad gin. It wasn't good for you. So what Hogarth is doing here is he's showing the results of the government action. Um, you can't really make it out, but one of the shops is called Killman, as in it kills men. Um, there's a carpenter pawning his tools, and of course, because he's pawned his tools to buy gin, he's not made to work, so it's a downward spiral. But most famously, in the center, is this woman. This woman is so drunk from um, consuming gin that she has <coughs> let go of her baby, and her baby is falling down the the brick steps, uh, and will die. So it's quite a powerful image, but what would have made it more powerful at the time was that this was actually based on uh, a true story. So Hogarth, he, he was angry. He, he wanted to satirise uh, the government's decision. The interesting thing at the time was, um, because the government was so unused to visual satire, they actually thought it was a pro-government picture. They actually thought it was an attack on the lazy working classes. So it just shows you right back then how, how little idea people had of social satire. But things soon started to change. This is a few years later. This is the first British Prime Minister, uh, Robert Walpole. Um, this is from a satirical magazine of the time. Uh, and although you can't see his face, uh, there would have been no doubt who it was. And... The reason I want to show you this is because this, this really is the beginning of newspaper cartooning. And it's, it's using 
It's using things that you will still see today. There was a, there was a cartoon in um, The Eye, I think, last Saturday with Donald Trump, um, and it used the same sort of symbolism. What's happening is this uh, MP is climbing up uh, the steps to kiss the Prime Minister on his back, back hand, uh, behind you, isn't it? The message is clear. If you want to get along in politics, that's how you do it. So, you know, you could say not a lot has changed. Um, but what happened here was the Prime Minister, uh, Robert Walpole, he didn't like this. He thought it was insulting. It, it, he thought it didn't show a respect for his position of authority. And this, of course, is what newspaper cartoons have been doing ever since. So what did he do? Well, he, he thought most of these things were sold as prints. So you could go down to your, your news agents and, and buy a print of this. Um, so we had the print sellers arrested. So he sent people out, they arrested the print sellers, they spent a night in jail, but then he realised that there was no law to charge them with. There was censorship of books and there was censorship of plays, but there was no censorship of visual satire. And this is why Britain has a grand tradition of satirical cartoons, because you cannot censor them. There is no legal censorship of cartoons. So, next up is Gilroy, probably the father of British cartooning. This is um, Pitt the Younger, a, a later British Prime Minister, and Napoleon. And this shows you something that you see in editorial cartoons to this day, use of symbolism. This is um, Europe as a pudding, and the carving of Europe between them. Um, Gilroy was a, was a brilliant um, artist, he was a brilliant satirist, but he was sadly mad. Um, and like many cartoonists, and I can't imagine why, uh, he, he drank too much, um, and he finally, um, he, he ran down the street in London and jumped in the Thames um, naked. Um, but still a father of British cartooning. Now, when I, when I mentioned about how images keep getting used, um, this is a, obviously a much more up-to-date cartoon. This is Steve Bell from The Guardian. Um, this is um, Cameron and uh, Nicola Sturgeon, and they're carving up the Labour vote. So you see how that image is reused. Um, you see this if you look at cartoons, editorial cartoons. Um, you keep seeing the reuse of images, and it's almost, it, it almost expects the reader to have some kind of visual library where they recognize what's going on. Of course, it works on its own. You don't need that. Now, I say editorial cartoons. Um, I think this is the point to, to say that there are two different kinds of cartoons in newspapers. Um, there's editorial cartoons and pocket cartoons. Um, pocket cartoons are this... Uh, in the 1700s and 1800s and the Victorian times didn't exist. It was just any editorial cartoon. So today, think of Steve Bell, um, this one, Peter Brooks in the Times, editorial cartoons tend to be quite large. They often don't have a joke or a caption, and they're often not supposed to be funny. They use, um, they use symbolism. In, um, in American editorial cartoons, they're always using donkeys and... Uh, um, Uncle Sam as symbols to, to make modern points. At this point, there's only editorial cartoons. Pocket cartoons, which are so-called because they just take up a single column of newsprint, so thing Matt in the Daily Telegraph. These are a much later invention. <coughs> so, most editorial cartoons are, and still are, are quite, are quite detailed, they're, they take a long time to draw. Um, this, is, this is an exception to the rule. This is Phil May. Now, Phil May is from Leeds, uh, which is why I'm showing you, really, because he was a brilliant cartoonist who drunk himself to death. Um, but he, he was a bit of a, a cul-de-sac, if you like, in the history of cartoons, because he introduced a simpler style, which most people ignore for another 40 years. So if it had lived, it's fascinating... Uh, to wonder what he would have done. Um, if you get to Whitby, there's actually a, a blue plaque. 
Not many blue packs in the cartoonists, but Phil May has one. But by and large, the editorial cartoon continued the same through the uh, 1800s, um, into the Victorian era, and even into the 20th century. Not much changed. Now this is David Lowe. David Lowe was probably the greatest editorial cartoonist of all time. Uh, he was drawing from the late 20s uh, to the 1950s. And obviously that period lived through a, a lot of turmoil. Now, this is an early David Lowe, uh, and I'd show you just purely, so you can still see that these are incredibly detailed cartoons. All the books are drawn individually, the fireplace is realistically rendered, <coughs> there's lots of crop hatching here. Um, this would take David Lowe probably half a day to draw. Now, he would draw one cartoon a day. He published in the um, Evening Standard, but was also essentially syndicated throughout the country, so everybody would see David Lowe's cartoon every day. Um, and he was very popular. He's significant, though, for one main reason. David Lowe changed not necessarily the way cartoons were drawn, but what went into them, what their message was. David Lowe was an interventionist cartoonist. By that, I mean that he wanted his work to change government policy. He wanted his work to change the way people think. Now, when he was drawn in the 1930s, and Hitler was on the rise in Europe, there were many people, most people probably, in, in authority in Fleet Street, who didn't want to criticize Hitler. The general attitude was one of, well, if we leave him alone, he'll leave us alone. Um, we don't want to upset him. David Lowe thought, no, th this isn't true. Th Hitler is, is evil, he's a maniac, and it's, it's not going to end well. So what he did was he started to draw cartoons very critical of Hitler. He also started to simplify his style. So this is a mid-30s cartoon. So about four or five years before the Second World War, um, but in Europe, Hit Hitler's on the rise. So this shows Hitler... Mussolini as a ventriloquist as a doll, and uh, the British Prime Minister Chamberlain, famous for his peace in our time. And obviously what, he's, what the message is, is that although Chamberlain is listening to Mussolini, Mussolini is just essentially saying exactly what Hitler wants him to say. Now, Hitler did not like this. In fact, he hated it. It drove him mad. Now, as, as the war began and um, Europe fell, Hitler had drawn up plans to invade Britain. The invasion was thought to be imminent. It was later discovered that Hitler had this black book. And in this black book was essentially a hit list of people who, when the Germans invaded, would be um, rounded up and shot on the spot, without any trial, they would be murdered. On this list were Churchill, members of the government, the war cabinet, um, leaders of the army, the navy, and so on, elite troops, so the parachute regiment, the commandos, and David Lowe. David Lowe was on Hitler's hit list. So why was that? It was because... David Lowe used one of the most powerful tools against the Nazis, ridicule. Years later, J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, said that ridicule was the most dangerous thing to the American state. It's the power of attacking someone who was essentially a bully, a mass murdering, psychotic, evil bully, but still, a, still in essence, a bully. Bullies do not like to be laughed at. And this was the power that when the Allies dropped British newspapers from planes into occupied Europe, Hitler at one point had people rounding up these papers and cutting out the David Lowe cartoon. Imagine that, of every single copy of a newspaper. Because he, he could not stand being ridiculed. But Lowe did more than just ridicule. As, um, as war began and a coalition government was formed, um, Lowe drew some of the most famous cartoons of the Second World War. Um, this is the British government, both sides. There's Churchill there and Attlee and the rest of the cabinet 
Um, basically, the roll, rolling up the sleeves, and the caption is all behind you, Winston. It was seen as very patriotic, it was inspirational, and it caught the mood of the time. Um, Lowe, again, was trying to motivate people to stand against Hitler. And it was, it, it was a very mot motivational cartoon, but again, it has been redone. Here's a more recent version, uh, after Lowe. Um, we've got Tony Blair at the front, uh, the Blair babes and, and uh, his cabinet and uh, the caption, not quite behind you, Tony. But Lowe continued to produce superb cartoons. This is one of his most famous. Um, this is when all of Europe had fallen. The German army was just across the channel and he had a British soldier on the edge with the German planes coming in saying, very well, alone. It really was, at the time, it was seen as motivational. Um, but it has, interestingly, been criticised since. A lot of the work of that period has been criticised um, as propaganda. And it's an interesting point, isn't it? Um, it seems to me, to be honest, being the Second World War, that you know, it was pretty much good versus evil. But even so, he is inter trying to intervene. He's trying to change opinion, or he's trying to bolster opinion. And this is what a lot of cartoonists were doing at this period. They were, they, they were definitely drawing cartoons that we would now consider propaganda. But, but Lowe and cartoonists like him were being incredibly brave. Because again, I, I re-stress, we thought this country was about to be invaded. Lowe knew he would be in deep, deep trouble. So still, drawing these kind of things against the wishes of some of the um, press barons who were, before the war, had been pro-Hitler, pro and they'd even told the editor of the Evening Standard to stop Lowe drawing the cartoons. But Lowe said he wouldn't do it, and his editor stood by him. Now, this is where things change. This is one of the very first pocket cartoons. So this is drawn a year into the war. This is Osbert Lancaster. Now, Osbert Lancaster was a brilliant artist. Um, he painted backdrops for West End plays. Um, he, he was brilliant at architectural drawings. But he wanted to, to bring something new to cartooning. So in 1914, the Daily Express, which then, possibly surprisingly, was a brilliant, fantastic newspaper and very popular, huge circulation, introduced the pocket cartoon. Now, so, so why change things? Well, first of all, as brilliant and as wonderful as editorial cartoons are, they are by definition big, so you can't put them on the front page. The pocket cartoon was designed so it could fit on the front page, so it had immediate impact. Um, they had to be drawn simpler because obviously there's a lot less space, so you, you can't have too much detail. And importantly, almost always, they are, at least are intended to be, funny. There's a gag, there's a joke. Now, this does exactly what Lowe was doing. Now, this is uh, ridiculing the Germans, um, that they're depressed uh, and thinking about the next war doesn't cheer them up. This, of course, was at the time when things were very dark. Was very, things were black for this country, but they were laughing, laughing at the Nazis. Again, they hated it. But Osbert Lancaster almost invented an entire form of cartooning to this day. Now, he was really prolific. He, he drew cartoons for, well, he drew over 10,000 cartoons. Here's, here's one I like from the 70s, um, when the test tube babies were in the news. And you see the style, simply drawn with a gag. Lovely. Now, I mentioned at the beginning Mel Kalman. Mel Kalman um, was uh, a designer originally, so he, he could certainly draw. He was a very good draftsman. But Mel Kalman wanted to take this further. He loved Osbert uh, Lancaster's work, but he wanted to, to be even, have even more impact. So he developed a style that can probably, you know, fairly called child, uh, childlike. You know, for people who say to me, oh, I'd like to be a cartoonist, but I can't draw. First thing I always say is, well, go and look at Mel Kalman. 
because although he could draw, you wouldn't know that from his work. He was also brilliant at combining incredibly simple images with um, a fantastic caption, really getting to the heart of matters. So the next one I'm going to show you is arguably one of the great pocket cartoons of all time. It's from the mid-80s, um, so this is a time of the miners' strike, um, the decline of British industry, uh, Thatcher in her uh, pomp, um, and huge unemployment. Uh, so on the front page of the Times uh, was this. Four words, four words that essentially sum up 80s Britain. Incredibly simplistic drawing style, as I've said, although as simplistic as it is, you can tell what it is. It's, it's a man, it's a boy. It's all you need, really. That's what pocket cartoons tend to be. You tend to need two characters because somebody has to be talking to the other person so you get the caption. So Mel Kalman, brilliant. Um, if, if you're interested at all, I would... Um, recommend picking up one of his books. You can get them on eBay, very cheap, uh, and um, they're very, very pithy and lovely. So the pocket cartoon went from strength to strength, but of course the editorial cartoon didn't stagnate. In fact, it, it blossomed in a way, and it blossomed in the 1960s uh, with a satire boom. So this is when you have the launch of um, Private Eye, uh, you have, uh, that was a week that was on TV, um, and suddenly, really for the first time in over 100 years, there's a huge increase in satire. And Private Eye was definitely at the forefront of this. The Private Eye from almost day one was being sued um, for um, offending people and, and winning a lot, to be fair. They won a lot because, you, you know, they... When you're a cartoonist, if you stay within the laws of um, libel and defamation, you can really do what you want because, as I say, we have no censorship. But they still cause a lot of offence. Now, this is a Gerald Scarf um, cover from Private Eye. Gerald Scarf still drawing today, draws uh, a weekly cartoon for the Sunday Times. Um, also famous for drawing Pink Floyd's The Wall. Um, and if you've ever seen Yes Minister... Uh, he, he drew the opening credits to that. But this is, um, this is Scarf. So what we've got here, it's captionless. Um, you've got Johnson, President Johnson, uh, the, Amer the then American president, and Harold Wilson, the British Prime Minister. So if you think about that Roger, uh, Robert Walpole that I showed you with the um, kiss in the Prime Minister's backside, Scarf is taking this to, a, to another level here. What he's got the British Prime Minister doing is he's pulling down the American President's trousers um, and he is um, extending his tongue. The message is quite clear. This caused uproar. <laughs> this caused the usual letters to the editor um, and it even was brought up in the House of Commons. But of course, it doesn't break any law. It's not respectful. Uh, it's the opposite to respectful. Um, but does that matter? Well, no, because that's what a cartoonist's job is. When relevant, you know, you, this was probably fairly a, a, dis a fair description of the relationship between Britain and America at that point. So he got away with it, and he continues to get away with it, more or less. This is Gerald Scarf from just a couple of years ago. So this is from the Sunday Times uh, two or three years ago. Uh, this is the Israeli Prime Minister. Uh, and what he's doing is he's building a wall uh, made of blood and the bodies of Palestinians. <coughs> so you see that kind of difference back to editorial cartoon in the symbolism. It's quite stark. Um, it's quite almost vicious. But this created a huge uproar because um, the Jewish lobby said that this was anti-Semitic because um, there's something called the blood libel, which is, which is, which is hundreds upon hundreds of years old, and it, it's, a, it's a myth, essentially, that uh, Jews used to steal Christian babies um, to use their blood to make bread. So, you know, a, a bit of a mad accusation, but it's an important accusation because it's been used time and time again to justify 
anti-Semitic attacks. Hitler used it. When someone you know, said to Hitler, well, how can you, how can you do these to, to people with the gas chambers and so forth? Hitler said, well, they're not really people, are they? You know, how can you call them people when they used to steal babies to make bread? So Scarf said that was not what he was referring to. His case was hindered somewhat by the fact that this was published on Holocaust Memorial Day. Yeah. So um, the point being, though, at the end of the day, is that it still shows the impact that editorial cartoons can have. Now, I talked about David Lowe and being on Hitler's hit list. This, this continues, and it, it continues across the world. In the 80s, um, there was a um, cartoonist from the Middle East who had been drawing cartoons in a, in a newspaper over there. He'd come to London to the London office of the newspaper, he was walking down the street, and uh, a man, well, we think it was a man, walked out, uh, lifted a gun, and shot him in the face. Dead. To this day, no one knows who it is. I think, as a tribute to that cartoonist, um, uh, Israeli Mossad and um, the Arab government have both been blamed for the attack. So, in other words, his cartoons attacked both sides, and yet he was, uh, he was murdered by one of those sides. And there are lots of it, there are lots of examples of this. Cartooning is an increasingly dangerous profession, as is a lot of journalism. Um, there was a cartoonist in Iran who had drawn a cartoon um, criticizing the leader. Uh, the plates of that cartoon were stolen uh, by the army. Not so terrible, perhaps. But then when the editor complained um, to the government and to a human rights organization, the newspaper was burned to the ground uh, and is never reopened. An Argentinian cartoonist um, around the time of the Falklands War, two cartoons uh, showing the military junta as aliens, um, and he and his four daughters um, disappeared and have never been seen since. Authority, figures in authority, often <coughs> hate cartoonists and cartoons. They hate being criticised. Now, in the, in the Western world, um, in places like Britain and America, obviously that doesn't happen. But censorship does still prevail. In America, both Pennsylvania and California have outlawed editorial cartoons at one point. The CIA, and this is what I love, the CIA had what, what was lovingly called the CIA art group. Now, this, this wasn't CIA agents going out with a watercolours paint in the White House. This was actually covert cartoonists. These, these were cartoonists in the pay of the CIA who were planted on newspapers um, so they could actually draw cartoons to support American policy. So the power of cartooning, although it can't be censored in democracies, is people still try to manipulate it. Steve Bell again, with his, um, his wonderful Wallace and Gromit. It's quite a funny image, this. Now, Steve Bell, I think, draws quite, and it's not a criticism, but quite nasty cartoons, are, the, the, the kind of vicious, and he's, he's very angry a lot. This one actually looks quite cute until you actually think about what's happening. You know, um, stabbed in the back, urinating. It, it, it's not a very positive image of our politicians. But what about the pocket cartoon as we get up today? Well... Steve Bell and Peter Brooks, particularly, uh, Guardian of the Times, do have a reputation as being quite vicious and scathing and angry. Uh, but then there's Matt in the Daily Telegraph. Now, Matt has been accused of being a little middle class, a little middle aged, uh, a, li a, a little sort of nice. But that's nonsense. Matt is um, a silent assassin. Matt, in very simple cartoons, as befits the, uh, the genre, hits the target, for my money, more often than any other cartoonist. He's the best cartoonist working in Britain today. Now, if we think about um, the MP's expenses scandal, that was, 
like Christmas for a cartoonist. Every single day when you thought, I can't possibly draw another cartoon about the MP's expenses, someone has claimed for a moat. Somebody has claimed for a duck house. It, it, someone has redecorated three flats. Brilliant. So Matt did this. See, so it's a pocket cartoon, so it's got a gap. It's simply drawn, although, again, you know exactly what that is, and you've got one person talking to another. But that, really, just straight in gets to the very heart. Now, of course, I'm biased, but I think this is the wonder of newspaper cartoons. That could be a 15,000-word feature. It could be a 500-word news story, or it could be a, what, seven or eight-word cartoon. Cartoons have this way of getting straight to the point, and it's what makes them popular. And he did it again, brilliantly for me, with the bankers' bonuses. Again, another, you know, if it hadn't been the fact that the country was disintegrating, that would have been hilarious. Um, and then there was a period, a few months on, when bankers had said, well, it wasn't our fault, we, 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 we did nothing wrong, uh, we're not actually sorry, but we will try and be nice from now on. Um, and, and we won't be awarding each other lots of bonuses. Um, so, back through this. <laughs> it's wonderful, isn't it? It is it, wonderful. And, and that, for me, gets right to the essence of what a cartoon can do. And it's not... It's not nasty in the way that editorial cartoons are. They actually quite they quite look nice. He looks quite nice, doesn't he? You know, he's not like an evil monster, but he doesn't need to be because it's all about the joke. And that's the thing about pocket cartoons. Pocket cartoons are all about the caption. There's an adage in cartooning in that the worst drawn cartoon in the world will still be published if the joke's good, but if the joke is bad, the best drawn cartoon in the world will never get published. In the New Yorker, which is arguably the, the very top of um, all cartoon publishing magazines, certainly pay the most, almost impossible to get in there, but they actually publish cartoons by a cartoonist who draws stick figures. He can't draw, but his captions are so brilliant that they still make it into, into the uh, magazine. So that's Matt, so that's up to date. So this is the context in which today newspaper magazine cartoonists are working. So what's it like to be a cartoonist? Well, it's, it's a great job. Um, Frank Dickens, who just recently died, he drew a strip cartoon in the Evening Standard at Bristow that ran for many, many years. Um, he used to draw six strips a week. Uh, he used to go into the office on a Monday morning he used to draw six strips Monday morning. He would go to the pub Monday lunchtime, and he would leave the pub on Friday. <laughs> that, I do sometimes think, is what people think being a cartoonist is like. It's easy, isn't it? You just, you just doodle a bit, and then, you know, you go down the pub. Sadly, the reality is not like that. One of, the, one of the two questions I get asked most, apart from, well, where do you get your ideas from, um, is how do I become a cartoonist? Well, it's a good question, isn't it? Because how do you become a cartoonist? Because th th there's no course, there's no qualification. Um, you can do courses online, but God help you if you turn up to an editor's office with your, your printed off certificate. Um, it just doesn't make sense. So how do you do it? Well, of course, the answer is with great difficulty. Um, there are, and I'm talking about newspaper magazine cartoonists, I, off the top of my head, can't think of any professional cartoonist who is under the age of 30. There may well be one or two, but... Um, and the reason for that is that it takes so long to get into. But, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to impress your parents if you, if you sort of rock up at the end of your degree and say... I'm going to be a cartoonist, Dad. Um, I'm not actually going to earn any money for a decade. Um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll draw some nice pictures. So how did I do it? Well, th th there isn't any one way to get into it. If you do want to do it, and the way cartoonists do it, is they draw all the time, they send the work off all the time, 
the work comes back rejected, and they keep doing it. But of course, you have to you have to pay the bills in the meantime. So what I did was, I've always loved newspapers. I've always loved journalism. It's what I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to draw cartoons. And I've always drawn. But I knew that I couldn't just walk straight into a job as a cartoonist. So I decided that um, the second best thing would be to get a job on a newspaper. Work as a journalist. Um, and while doing that, keep drawing the cartoons and sending them off. But also having a, you know, a, a foot in the editor's office. Um, so I did that, I did my NCTJ, and I, 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 worked on, um, I worked on a newspaper, worked on the news desk, I covered um, garden fates, supermarket openings, and, and gradually worked my way up and ended up with murder trials and, and such like. But all the time, drawing cartoons. Um, and then I went, uh, I went freelance, and I was working as a freelance journalist doing features. But really, all the time, I wanted to be a cartoonist. So how did I get my break? Well, what I did was, to be honest, just made a right old pain in the arse of myself. I badgered editors. I sent them work. I phoned them up. I, I even, on one memorable occasion, waited outside a newspaper office for the editor to come out and accidentally bump into him uh, and say, oh, oh, look at that. I've got some cartoons in my hand. Um, and finally, the, the editor of the Sheffield Star, um, which is quite a, lar you know, quite a large regional title, um, agreed to see me after work one day. So I went along, and he, and he asked me, because I'd done, some, you know, I'd done some writing for him, he asked me what I wanted, and I said, I want you to give me a job as a cartoonist. Um, he laughed. Uh, he, he said, well, we don't have a cartoonist. Um, of course, those, those magical words, we don't have a budget for a cartoonist. Um, and I said, well, look, I want to be a cartoonist on this newspaper. You tell me what I have to do um, from today to get there, and I will do it. So I made a commitment to send him a cartoon every day for six months based on what was in the paper that day, um, not to be published, just so he could see how I covered news and how I, I drew. Um, it didn't take six months. It, it took three years. Now, obviously, I was doing other things at the same time. I had a, a job, and I was writing, and I was sending things off to magazines and making a few sales here and there. Um, but finally, after three years, um, he phoned me up, and he said, look, I'm sick and tired of these envelopes appearing on my desk every day. Just draw me a cartoon. So that was how I got in. It was, it was three days a week at first. Um, and do you know what? How much more difficult it was when suddenly you, were at, you knew there was a blank space in the paper every day that you had to fill. But I loved it, and it's brilliant, you know. And so today, um, I work for lots of titles. My day is like this, and then prepare yourself, because this is ugly. I will get up at 6 o'clock every day, uh, listen to the Today program, uh, BBC Radio, and then I, I have a deadline to draw my star Sheffield newspaper cartoon for 9 o'clock in the morning. And it's a deadline. I I've never missed it. I never would miss it. But some days it can be brilliantly obvious, you know, if it's Trump. Yes. Um, Trump wins. <laughs> That's a week worth of cartoons in 10 minutes. Then you can go to the pub for the week. Um, but other days, of course, it's not so easy. And one of the problems facing cartoonists today is how you cover certain stories. Now, you, you all remember when um, the uh, terrorist attack on uh, Charlie Hebdo. Now, this is one of those situations when you're faced with having to draw something funny about something that is intrinsically unfunny. You know, people died. It isn't funny. You can't laugh at people who've died. But, of course, you can laugh at the people who were the murderers. So I, I had to come up with something for the next day's paper about those attacks. And obviously, as a cartoonist, they're going to want the cartoonist to respond to it. So I thought I channeled the spirit of David Lowe um, and all those other cartoonists who have, who have ridiculed people in power or, in this case, a terrorist. And, and, and I thought about, um, I don't know why, but I thought about top trumps. 
You know when you get the... Yes, good, not just me. Um, so this is my Holy War top trumps. I particularly like the suicide vest versus the Martin Spencer vest. Uh, and probably the cardigan not done up properly. Um, but of course, as I say, it isn't funny. You know, the attacks weren't funny. But you can still make a point, can't you? You can still, you can still make the point that there is a real difference between somebody who draws silly doodles for a living uh, and someone who goes around with a machine gun killing people. Um, but that story kept going, of course, and, and that brings about one of the problems that faces journalists in the day-to-day -day jobs, and certainly as cartoonists, is when the story is the same, the same lead story the next day, you have to cover it another way. You can't do the same cartoon. And other publications want a cartoon. So Private Eye wanted uh, a cartoon on this. So I'll show you what I did for Private Eye in a moment. The problem with the Charlie Hebdo attacks, or the problem with the meaning behind them, was that the cartoons uh, of the Prophet Muhammad were deemed to be offensive. Now, this is a problem, isn't it, for the cartoonists? Because right back to Hogarth and, and uh, Walpole, cartoonists have been offending. It's their job. Um, New York Times cartoonists said that if I am not being malicious every day, I am not doing my job properly. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. I, I don't think you have to be malicious for the sake of it. Some, some days the, the story is, you know, it's not a malicious story. But you certainly need to be holding authority up to book. Osbert Lancaster said that the cartoonist's job is to tell people that the emperor is butt naked. But, equally, what happens if you, if you draw a cartoon that offends someone? Well, I'm, I'm always offending people, not always intentionally. Secondary school teachers really don't like me. They, they, they send endless letters into the paper about me picking on them and do they not know how much marking they have and they don't all go home at R3 and, you know, and all that. Uh, and I drew a cartoon yesterday of the week when they're on strike again um, to say that two kids talking at one century to the how come when we do it it's called truancy. <laughs> they, uh, they got really angry and one actually, t actually turned up at the, at the front desk of the newspaper banging on the counter uh, demanding to see me. Luckily I was of course in the pub. <laughs> but, so what do you do with the fence? Well, this, this was my private eye cartoon. Now, this was in the issue, uh, I think the issue directly after the Charlie Hebdo attacks. So it was quite somber, um, but I think it makes the point, doesn't it? If you're not, if you're going to worry about who you're going to offend, then you're never going to do anything. You're never going to write any copy. Um, you're never going to cover any story. And as a cartoonist, you're certainly never going to draw anything. <coughs> but what do you do when the news is terrible, but it's, it's nobody's fault, essentially, if there's a natural disaster? You know, um, if, if, like, the earthquake in Italy, um, you know... Uh, the answer, to be honest, a lot of the time is you, you ignore it. You, you, you try and look for something else. Um, because there is no humour there. And if you're an editorial cartoonist, you can do that thing with a, you know, the Statue of Liberty crying and, and that kind of stuff. I, I'm not a fan of that, but that's not really the pocket cartoonist way. Um, but sometimes a story is so big, and it is just blanket coverage in the news that you have to address it. And I, I, I hate those days. But you have to do it. And a classic example would have been the story a year or so ago of um, the boat full of migrants that capsized and then in Turkey the, the soldier picking up the dead child off the beach. You know, it, it, it was everywhere and it had, to be, it had to be covered. So I drew this. Now, the star, they actually they, they took everything off page two in the newspaper and they just blew this cartoon up um, to fill the page. Uh, just with a one line underneath that just said, there, um, no editorial can say more than this. Every time I show this cartoon, there is absolute quiet. And I think it's because, obviously, there's nothing to laugh at, but also, 
It's just heartbreakingly sad. And I think even when the news is that bad, a cartoon can still work. I mean, it's drawn slightly more realistically than, than most of my stuff. Um, it, it's very simple, and as I say, it, it, it was, you know, it, it had quite an impact. But I don't, if I'm honest, like it or anything like that. Obviously, you don't like the news. Um, but I always prefer to have a little bit of humour. So, today then, what, what am I faced with on a day? Well, you've got two things that keep coming up. You've got, you've got Parliament, MPs, the government, and you've got, especially in a regional paper, you've got councils. Councils. I, honestly, I, should, I don't, but I should, I should send Sheffield Council flowers and chocolates and stuff because they make my job so much easier. You know, if, if councils were sensible um, and didn't try and spin things to you all the time, you know, I don't know what I do six days a week. Um, this is a cartoon from earlier this year. <laughs> now, this is obviously Sheffield's um, <coughs> specific labels, but you could really, the labels are interchangeable. The point is the same, isn't it? The Save Our Trees, I don't know if anyone knows about this, has been a huge thing in Sheffield um, over the last year of the council with, in league, and I use that term, in league with a private contractor, have been chopping down 100-plus-year-old um, uh, trees uh, under, the, under the pretense that they're dangerous because the roots have broken up the pavement and you might fall over. No one ever has, of course, but, but you made it. Some people who, who may be of a cynical bent have said that, um, well, it's actually cheaper to cut the trees down than it is to maintain them. But the council, oh, no, 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 we're, we're being fair-minded. There's, a, there's a, a park in Sheffield called Enclave Park in, in a, you know, a nice affluent part of the city. It's got these beautiful trees on the street outside, and it's the centre of the campaign. This morning, this very morning, the council with the police, turned up to start cutting down the trees at 4.30 in the morning. They removed people's cars without any, without the people knowing, and they cut down. Now, the council have said, this wasn't so the press couldn't be there, or this wasn't so the protesters couldn't be there. We just thought it was... Um, a good time of the day to do it because it wouldn't create any traffic issues. Any authority that can come out with rubbish like that deserves everything they get. And they do make my idea, my life, much easier. One of the other things you deal with, of course, is you deal with stories that come around all the time that, that are sort of um, annual, for example. Classic example would be Freshers Week. Every single September, the editor says to me, can, you ha can we have a Freshers cartoon? We love a Freshers cartoon. Now, bear in mind, I've, I've been doing this for a decade. You know, it's, oh God, I know the Freshers cartoon. But this, this I, thought you, I thought you may appreciate this. <laughs> so that's a story, you know, every, every year that comes around. Stories, other stories come around more often, of course. And, of course, one of the things that comes around all the time is cuts. Cuts to all sorts of things. Um, cuts to services, cuts to bus services, um, and, and quite recently, uh, cuts to the police. The police services are being cut time and time again. Last time somebody saw a bobby on the street in Sheffield was, was they were chasing the great train robbers. Um, it, and it's a stop. So what do you do? Well, you, you do have to keep coming up with cartoons. So here's one from the police cut. I think it's quite sad, that, actually. But again, that was, you know, that, that went down well, and, and the police actually bought the original. One of the great things about being a cartoonist is that people buy the originals. And this is one of the weird things about being a cartoonist, and any newspaper cartoonist will tell you this. The amount that you attack somebody by name, an MP, say, or a councillor, is directly linked to how much they will pay you to buy the original. <laughs> it is bizarre. The nastier you are, 
the more they will offer you for the original. Now, it may be that they do all put them up in the toilet, but even so, that's one of the nice byproducts. Um, and of course, one of the terrible cuts that keep coming around are cuts to the NHS. Um, this is, it's almost, it's beyond being funny that. It's, it's serious, uh, and yet I still have to approach that in a hopefully humorous way. So here's one from just a couple of weeks. This is from Private Eye on um, NHS cuts. Now, I, I like this because really it's, it's all about the one word, isn't it? Just changing one word around. Um, and again, poor doctor. So, that's almost it. I just want to finish off with saying that, you know, being a newspaper cartoonist is undoubtedly one of the best jobs you could have. You get to work on a newspaper, which is brilliant. You do get to go to the pub occasionally, not all the time. Um, it's a brilliant, every day is different, um, and even when topics like Brexit keep coming up, It does keep providing you with new angles. And I think it, being a cartoonist is no different from being a reporter or a feature writer. Um, you, you're looking for new angles on things all the time. So whether it's a, a sad story, um, a scandal, or, or just hypocrisy, there's always, I think, there's some way that you can find a new angle. And I'll, just, I'll show you one more, just to finish off. Even with everything I've said, sometimes, as being a cartoonist, you can just get paid to draw a truly terrible joke. So it doesn't always have to be doom and gloom, and this is one of my favorites. Uh, this was from an America magazine. <laughs> That's it, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are you happy to take some questions? Sure. Who's got a question for James? How do you put a price on a cartoon? Is this some sort of a guideline? Or you mean how much you get paid? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you get, it, it depends who you're working for. For, for the star, which is a, a debt, which is a, a contract, you, you just get paid monthly. For individual cartoons that you, you sell, um, you don't put a price on, uh, unless you're selling to an individual, to a magazine or a newspaper. They tend to have a fixed rate. There's a definite pecking order. Um, not allowed to talk about amounts, but um, it starts with private eye at the top, who by far pay the most, um, and then it goes down for the spectator and the old the magazines like that. And then more, I, I work for Hi Fi News, which is a glossy, uh, a glossy monthly magazine, but they don't pay that much. Um, it just depends, really. Of course, what goes with how much you get paid is how much in demand you are. I think private eye publish about uh, a dozen, 15 cartoons an issue. I think they get 500 cartoons for every issue sent to them. So of 500, they choose 12. So it's that's why they pay so long. So you don't, you know, don't you don't get make a living by sending it to a um, caravan monthly. Also, a question for Mark. I was just going to say, um, despite the Charlie Hebdo attacks, obviously that put people off um, expressing the voice through cartoons. Would you say it's Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, it, like I said, it has become more dangerous being a cartoonist. Um, yeah. And I think what was interesting in the aftermath of Charlie Hebdo was that Stephen Fry called for every newspaper and magazine in Britain to republish those cartoons, and not a single one did. Uh, even Private Eye, Ian Islop said that he, he just he didn't think there was any point. I think probably he may have been thinking about his, his you know, the staff. Um, but it, it's, it's a problem, and you have to ask yourself, whenever you're drawing anything like that, there is a little voice in your head, but I think if you start to listen to that voice, then you become, um, you become a victim of the censorship of fear, um, and you start to censor your own work, and that's a very slippery slope. So I would not go out my way to draw, I've never drawn um, a Mohammed cartoon, then again, I've never drawn a, drawn a Jesus cartoon. It's never really needed to. Um, it's very difficult. I think at the end of the day, it just has to be a personal choice. Uh, you mentioned uh, with, like, with secondary school teachers that they say they go in and complain about 
you mm. use, then you use that stuff that they're coming to complain about, and then you use that. Oh, God, yeah, everything's material. Everything. everything is material. This is material. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I don't, you know, I've, I've got friends who are secondary school teachers, and, and, and I love them to bits, but they do whinge a lot. Um, and the thing is, you know, when you're having to go with politicians, and, and they do sometimes want to buy the originals, well, they, they take it in, you know, they, they, they take it as part of the job. If you ever go with the bin men, you know, you, you don't get, you, your bins still get emptied, but there, there's, there's something about, there is something about teachers that I know don't, it just seems to hit a nerve a lot, but yeah, it's, it just, I just think, yeah, more teacher cartoons. Anybody else? Okay, well, a couple of things I took away from that brilliantly insightful talk was, I mean, it was part history lesson, part kind of experiences, but some really big takeaways for us as people who aspire to be journalists. And the one thing, two things I got was, A, the power of pictures, you know, saying, do the job of several thousand words, as we've seen with the examples of James said. And the other thing was, and it, this resonated with what Danielle was talking to us about earlier, was the sheer determination that you've got to have sometimes to get the job that you really want. She made a deal with the person who gave her the job that she was going to learn shorthand. James, you know, sent a cartoon in every day for six months. They kind of made that commitment to get the job they really wanted, but they were both successful. So I think that's a really big kind of lesson that we could all learn. But just to, in the usual way, we'll say thank you to James for what was a really good <laughs>